Kia ora koutou whanau. Welcome back to another edition of Big Hairy News. Kia ora, Chewie. Kia ora, Pat. I, I have a guest in the studio. I, I've, I've Is it been, a dog? I've been graced. Is it a dog? Tiny uh, dog. Hey, wave. Yeah. Wave. Yeah. Belly rubs. <laughs> She'll have to wait. <laughs> yeah, mine's asleep at the end there as well. I should I should set up dog cam again, eh? So then when yeah, they, people like dog cam. cam. Yeah, I should, I should set that up again. Um, what's crackalacking? What's going on? What's happening? Oh, not a lot. Just a day of work. Um, I saw what was it? We had, we had a, a lovely rainbow out here, and oh, um, hope Destiny Church didn't turn up. Uh, uh, um, I was just going to say the the fun part about that is uh, the rainbow ended on an old church up in Roslyn. Yeah, uh, I found that pretty amusing. In fact, if it, if it's the one that I know, if it's the big old white one, the uh, Anglican one, mm. they're perfectly okay with rainbows at that church. I know some people who go there. I figured as much. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, very good. Yeah, no, I've just been working my a hole off, trying to fit five days of work into three days, so I can go away for the weekend. Jump in the car and head up to Central and up there Friday, Saturday, Sunday nights, come back Monday. So, yes, just work, 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 work. But I did get time to go and get a, a haircut as well. A quick haircut. And it was one of those days, Murphy's Which Law. Yeah. Uh, Murphy's Law, of course. Um, I'm really busy in the studio doing lots and lots and lots of work. And my 14-year-old phones me at 20, par- oh, 20 to 6. She was supposed to be on the quarter to 6 bus to come home from her friend's place. And she goes, hey, Dad. And I'm like, yep. She goes, can you come pick me up? And I said, oh, I, can't, I really can't, mate. I've got so much. And she goes, I forgot my bus pass and I've got no money. I'm like, oh. So in the car, go and pick her up. Cool. Are those actual ones from like today's or are you just looking at rainbows now? No, no, no. That's from, that's from today. That's a, that's a cool one. Full full semi-circ. The full semi-circ. Well, <laughs> tonight's going to be fun. Um, it's official. If it wasn't already, uh, David Seymour is a peak an idiot, like an absolute, yeah, no. but like, do you know, just an, an app, like a, uh, use whatever expletive you want and then add the word more on at the end, just the stupidest man on the face of the planet. Like, honestly, either, it's, it's like, he's either so deluded in his neoliberalism or he's the dumbest man on the face. Now we know someone Chewy, who we speak to often. He tells us he's really, really smart. So if we, if he is, if he has an IQ smart, like if he is actually smart, and he's saying and doing what he's doing, then it's, I guess, it's got to be the ugliest ideology in the world. Anyway, we'll get to him as we go through. Oh, speaking of a friend that we know and talk to often, a cool clip tonight from the Working Group podcast. Uh, old Shane Depoe had a bit of a crack at uh, Damien Grant on separatism. I thought we'd play that. That Hang sounds on. like a that sounds like a bit of fun. Hang on. Oh, sorry. Yep. I mean, Damien Grant. What's... Yeah, that guy. That that's convicted fraudster, Damien Grant. That's the same one. That's and why also, that name's familiar. Someone who's done a lot of amazing work as an advocate in New Zealand, Louise uh, Nicholas, was on uh, one of the breakfast shows this morning, and they were talking about the three strikes law. And I was just thinking, Joey, and it's not because we play favourites, um, Queen Chloe. No, it's just the names that popped into my head when we said favourites for some reason. Um, but you know how we say. Sometimes it feels ugly to agree with like a Mike Hosking or, a, you know, when you, when they say something that resonates. Well, if yeah. that's the case, then the equal and opposite is true. Someone who you respect and think is a great person and does some great work um, can get it wrong too. Oh, yeah. And Louise Nicholas has it wrong on three strikes. Um, and we'll tell you why. It's not actually necessarily a massive ideological issue. It's that there's just something missing from the equation in her support of three strikes so we'll have a look at that tonight as well uh and a bunch of other stuff but let's just start off by saying uh hello and kia ora and thank you to all our lovely patrons our lovely patrons they're lovely aren't they lovely um very pleased and happy to have you on board so uh thankful that you're a part of us down the bottom there barb uh barb is a new uh, patron part of the coffee runner so shout out to barb uh today and you are starting to give me that problem of reshaping things, reshaping things also down the bottom here. Uh, Jacob Hetherington, uh, new uh, patron just from today. So shout out to uh, Jakob. Uh, thanks for coming on board. Thanks for being a part of what we do. And uh, if you want to uh, be more about a part of what we do, you want to be a part of our uh, patronage, then all you need to do is head to patreon.com forward slash big hairy 
news. Um, Speaking of the patron list, mate. Yes. Do you remember when it was very exciting when we had three names on there and one of them was mine? Yeah, I noticed you've, you're not a patron anymore, Chewy. I was going to have a talk to you about that, but you know, come Am on. Am I not? <laughs> no. <laughs> Chewy signed up to be a patron to basically test the system, and then he hung around for about six months, obviously forgetting he'd signed up to help test the system, which I thought was hilarious. <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, lots going on tonight, but I just do, I do want to start with one very small story. It's not really relevant to anything we're doing, but there's, there is a movement coming to ban things that do not exist. So in Tennessee, oh, Republicans have passed an anti-chemtrails bill, despite chemtrails not existing. Now, there is rumors that the Easter Bunny and the Woolly Mammoth and Bigfoot are going to be banned as well. But at the moment in Tennessee, there was a law, a bill passed through a certain level of government to uh, ban chemtrails the u.s state of tennessee has passed a bill that seemingly bans chemtrails despite the fact that chemtrails do not exist sorry spoiler Dumbest if you didn't know shit. that spoiler sorry well this is this is a good night to have this story because we're talking about the dumbest shit in the world and the dumbest shit in new zealand politics with david seymour so it kind of lines up with what we're talking about tonight the republican <laughs> But it's funny, you're surprised. The Republican sponsored bill prohibiting the quote, intentional injection, release, or dispersion by any means of chemicals, chemical compounds, substances, or apparatus within the borders of this state into the atmosphere. Actually, it's not a bad, I'd like to make sure that never happened as well. The thing is, though, it doesn't happen now. You know, unless this is the best foresight you've ever seen. And in 18 months from now, there's going to be that happening as a terrorist attack, but they've banned it early. That could be the other reason. It just passed through the state's House of Representatives on uh, Monday local time. It had already passed in the Senate and will now be considered by the state's Republican governor, Bill Lee. If he signs it, it will go into effect on January the 1st. So Tennesseans, if you're in the industry of chemtrailing, you're pro chemtrails, you like supply the chemicals that they use for the chemtrails, you need to get together now and fight this because if you don't on July the 1st, your livelihoods could be under threat, Chewy. <sighs> this is the dumbest shit. Like if, if you want to point to, to people and go like, are you, are, do you remember, I, I see someone's just mentioned it in the chat. Do you remember when, um, when MPs fell for that whole ban, um, ban water. No, like the, the chemical composition of water. Someone was what circulating H2O? a bill. Uh, yes, but the other name for it, I'm just trying to find who mentioned it in the chat. Dihyd dihydrogen monoxide is another name for water. Um, <laughs> and it's, it's often circulated around just showing that our elected officials often don't have a grounding in science. So let me read and it. Otago MP Jackie Dean felt like a bit of a waller yesterday after it was revealed she tried to ban North Otago's most precious commodity, water. Mrs. Dean has confirmed she was caught in a hoax. So yeah, but this is the thing. Okay, so maybe they can be fooled with, you know, uh, science -y names, but Google search? Like that mm. means that that means that this MP did zero research and just went stamp of approval. I was caught in a hoax by an online blogger asking her for help in banning dehydrogen monoxide, a monoxide, monoxide, which it turns out is the chemical name for ordinary H two O. Yeah. So actually, the more concerning thing about that is Jackie Dean would go, "Yep, yep, I'll support that." What is it? Ah, I'll support it. That that's the more concerning thing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. and 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 it just like as, as you said. Like Google it, I can ask a science advisor. Yeah, call up a high school chemistry teacher. You know, yeah. it, it, it's not much. And when you're talking about chemtrails and that sort of thing, like that, this means that that there are people in that Senate that are so scientifically illiterate. Um. So oh, Chewy, you always do this to me. You always do this to me. I was just getting all excited about the words that were going to come next. Um, I mean, just 
just I'm not going to now double back, but just to um to to Dean's uh, like in defence of Dean, I just googled exactly. I copied and pasted, and it didn't doesn't just say very bluntly, is the chemical name for water. It says dehydrogen monoxide is a chemical compound that is commonly used in lab investigations. This chemical compound, sometimes referred to as hydric acid, is colourless and odourless. DHMO is known to be a part of many environmental hazards. Oh, well, what have I got wrong then? Maybe that's maybe I copied across what they thought it would be. Maybe that's what I did. So, but if that's what Google search comes back, then again, you can you can make a mistake. Did you see what I just did? Look, I just I just copied off there, helping banning dehydrogen monoxide, and I just googled it, right? And um, it doesn't just say water. It, it says is a chemical compound that is commonly used in lab investigations. The chemical compound is sometimes referred to as hydric acid. Is a colourless, odourless DHMO is known to be a part of many environmental hazards. So maybe she did Google it, and maybe she got the same response as I did. I'm just being fair, you know. We we like to laugh at the at, at silly people, but when I googled those two words, that's what I came up with. So, okay, maybe withdraw and apologise. We will. Can't hear you. You got no microphone, Chewy. Chewy, I'm deaf. Something's happened to you. You know, everyone will leave if Chewy can't talk. Chewy is the favourite. Um, whilst Chewy's sorting himself out. We will uh, get maybe get into the first story. We can't hear you, Chewie. It says parody on the side. Oh, does it? It says parody on the side. Oh, okay. I'll shut up then. Okay. Hey, um, yeah, I, I see what you're saying, Cypher. I see that as well. Uh, H2, dihydrogen, O, oxide, dihydrogen oxide. All right. All right. Um, I guess what I'm saying is if she did do a Google search, I, she could have got caught out that way. That's all. Um, Cunning Stunts wants to come in and do the voiceover for Chewy. Can you get loud enough and angry enough, though? That is the overall question. I can see Chewy's in the green room trying to sort some stuff out. So while he's doing that, let's um, get into the story. Which one should we do first? Let's get into the... Oh, they're all so good tonight. I know Chewy doesn't want to miss any of them. Okay, so just really clear, this conversation is not to... Uh, speak down to to negate the work that she's done to in any way hassle uh louise nicholas because phenomenal human being great new zealander you know one of the more high profile victims of sexual crime and one of the one of the biggest advocates for women's rights and and for um for victims at the moment as well so um the louise nicholas trust there it is louise uh, oh, louise nicholas trust.org.nz um all about uh, sexual prevention is a huge problem in Aotearoa. The goal of the Louise Nicholas Trust is to stop sexual violence from happening in the first place. In order to prevent sexual violence, we must uh, understand and address the risk and uh, protective factors at the individual, relational, community and societal levels by working together. Every person has a role to play in preventing sexual violence. So, no, not, we don't have a, a bone to pick against Louise Nicholas, but yeah, in this conversation today, she got something or get something pretty wrong, and I think it's important to point out. Are you back with us, Joey? Uh, I am. Yep, I can hear you. All good. All right, so let's play this first part. So they're talking about three strikes, right? And the first part of this conversation uh, is the host, uh, is it's Jenny May, um, speaks to the victim advocate, which of course is Louise Nicholas, and uh, she's asking about what survivors want when it comes to three strikes like what what do people want and this is the first part of the conversation louise can i start with you why is it um that you think it's a good thing that we bring back three strikes i've been uh, doing this work supporting survivors um through the criminal justice system for 15 16 years now and during that time when the three strike law was there um those that were given the strike uh, our survivors were saying, good, this needs to happen because we don't want this person back out in the community reoffending. If this can be a deterrent for that person, for the, for the community, it's a good thing. Roger, can I bring you so, in? So um, we've also got a criminologist who is uh, part of this conversation as well. His name is Roger, Brook, Roger Brooking. And we'll let kind of the them set up their shop front, first of all. They kind of both have an opening statement. And then we'll look specifically to where Louise has got it wrong, in, in my opinion. 
Um, and I think I, I don't often like to speak for us, Chewy, but I think what we know of and what the show knows of, what I know of, of the three strikes law around the world is it, it doesn't work and it's not a, a it doesn't offer a, um, a deterrent in any way, shape, form whatsoever. And in fact, in the ways that international countries do have who have things like lots of gun murders, sometimes it can go the other way. So someone has two strikes against them and they know that if they get the third strike, then they're done forever, then they will do anything to get out of that law. It doesn't matter how many people they kill, they just, their only objective is to get away, no surrender. So th it doesn't work. It's not good around the world. That's what the research shows as well. Um, and I, I, what I'm going to point to and what we're going to talk about as well is the thing that Louise gets wrong is not necessarily her position. It's what she wants from the three strikes. What she says victims wants, three strikes won't actually provide. So when I say she's wrong, it's that she's saying this is what we want, blah, 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 but three strikes won't provide any of that. So that's the that's the area we'll talk through. But let's go to the uh, criminologist, uh, Roger Brooker. Uh, we'll give him a couple of minutes as well, and he'll lay out um, why he is again, for and again, he is again the three strikes. Why is it that you don't want three strikes to come back? Well, there's three, uh, it's an ignorant piece of legislation, and there's three good reasons why um, it just doesn't work. First of all, it doesn't act as a deterrent, um, and that's primarily because people who end up committing these kinds of crimes have all kinds of uh, mental health issues, addictions, uh, brain injuries, traumatic brain injury, new other you know neurodiverse issues, and they don't make rational decisions and think about the consequences well, I've done this twice before. If I do it once more, I'm going to get a, you know, a seven-year prison sentence. They don't think like that. So that's a one thing just to make clear as well. In New Zealand, it's called three strikes and the max. That's what um, I remember very well talking to Rodney Hyde about it. And what it meant was in America, they used to call it three strikes and you're out, like baseball, because on the third strike, you were just locked away forever. Whereas in New Zealand, it was always three strikes and the max, which means on the third strike, you would get the max sentence for that crime. Um, so like, you know, we spoke recently of an MP who committed some crimes when it came to stealing. And um, I think the max was multiple, like five or maybe even seven years in prison. So if, that had, if someone had to take an address, just to use that example, and that was their third strike, no matter what the judge thought, no matter what the circumstances around it, they would have have to have given them seven years in jail for that dress. Um, not to uh, obviously... Uh, say what happened is okay but just add that example mm. popped into my mind so in new zealand it was three strikes and the max um do you want to say anything before i keep playing joe no no keep rolling all right keep rolling the first thing it does not deter offending the second thing is that it removes uh the judici judicial discretion of judges basically it it makes judges they have to impose these uh long sentences so it turns judges into rubber stamps basically and I don't think that's helpful for justice in New Zealand. And thirdly, when the three strikes legislation was actually operating in New Zealand, it led to some manifestly unjust results. There was a couple of individuals who got a seven year prison sentence, one of them uh, for kissing somebody in the street. That was his third strike. And the other one was a guy in, already in prison on his second strike and he patted a female prison officer on the backside. Not cool. I'm not saying that's justifiable yeah. behavior, but it doesn't justify a seven year prison sentence with no parole. So there you go. That's the first two parties who are setting out their wares when it comes to this conversation, Chewy. Uh, I'm going to go through next and show you a couple of things that uh, Louise Nicholas says. And again, the, 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 dis, the, the disagreement with her position is uh, what she says victims want the three strikes law will not provide. I'll show you that in a second. But anything you yeah. want to jump in there, Chewy? Yeah, look, I, I, I kind of want to put my thoughts in here about three strikes. I, I agree. It doesn't work. Um, it is great if you want to appear tough on crime, which is why you see it parroted by the people that parrot it around the world. We have decades of data from the US that it doesn't work. Mm. We have tried it here, and it doesn't work. Um, there are people that are unfortunately the victims of crime and yes, it's an emotive issue for them. Of course they want to want these people to go away for longer. You know, I feel for them. That's a natural human reaction. But is it 
right like justice has to be in some cases really dispassionate about stuff and if they if they're going to go with those sort of vibes uh, of, of just punishment not crime prevention which is what we should be looking at but punishment yeah then that's what we're going to get and in every case that three strikes has been trialed what you end up is with is overcrowded prisons yeah, yeah. and i think if you combine this with with getting rid of cultural reports as well like we don't want to understand what has led this person down the path we don't want that information we don't want that data we just want to crack down on this person and then we want to make sure that we have the heaviest bat there available at all times yeah and and remember the the combo the the idea of the cultural so let me paint you a picture that one the guy got seven years for kissing the wrong person it was friday night he'd been out with the boys they were all happy they had a great time he was drunk he thought he saw someone he knew went up gave him a kiss was like oh my god i'm so sorry I'm a, and the person who he kissed took umbrage called the police seven years the the no cultural reports and remember i learned this as well so i'm not saying i had this all right cultural reports means anything leading up to the crime that might impact the crime like those things that i've just said in this hypothetical that that now won't be looked at won't be negotiated and uh, as the uh, as the criminologist uh, Roger Brooking was saying, uh, the the judge will have to just go, sorry, dude, ch chunk chunk seven years. Now think about this as well. I'm, I'm, I haven't researched this so much, but remember this government is also about saving money, about being um, proactive with New Zealand's funds, putting people in prison who don't need to be in prison for seven years for a kiss, for seven years. Is hugely expensive. Hundred, it's one hundred ninety thousand dollars a year, I think, to keep a basic, not even like maximum security, but a basic security prisoner. So there you go. Seven years, you've just uh, cost the country over a million bucks for a kiss. But this is what what this government and this side of the political spectrum do all the time. They'll say one thing, and they'll say, "Oh, it's all about saving money." You know, government's got to cut its cloth. We've got to make sure we don't overspend. We overcommit. And then when it comes to things like this, they will just commit to doing things that will end up costing far more than we need to spend on issues that don't need to be handled like that. So it's hypocrisy and it's stupidity as well, Chewie. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Um, okay, so let's go to the second part of this conversation. So this is Louise Nicholas again. It's just a 16 second clip. And um, the question gets asked by uh, Jenny May, you know, what, what do offenders want? Um, what do they want? What was it from as an offender advocate or offend, a victim's advocate. Um, what do the uh, what do the victims want? What do they need? And listen to this uh, very quick statement. Well, for, for a lot of our survivors, Jenny May, but they're not. All they want is for the person that has harmed them to get the uh, the help that is needed, so that when they do come back out into our community, they are safe. The community is safe. So straight at the first point, three strikes doesn't do that. In fact, do you think that the person that we're talking about who kissed someone and got seven years, they're going to have a, a positive time in jail going, oh, yep, I shouldn't have kissed that person. Now I'm going to now I'm going to get better. And when I come back out into society, I'm going to be a better person. So my disagreement with Louise Nicholas has to do with what she's looking for, I believe, from Three Strikes. Three Strikes doesn't provide. I'll play one more, Chewy, and then I'll, you can have a crack at it. Um, this is the same sort of thing. Uh, what victims want, and she does a list of things. I've got them written down. It's about nine. Uh, it's about sixty seconds ish. And uh, so this is what, why this is one of the reasons why Louise Nicholas supports um, the three strikes legislation. They, they don't believe that um, what has happened to them is is the the time that is given and for a prison sentence. Um, like, you know, if, if you rape somebody, the prison sentence is 20 years. We've never ever seen that. That has never happened. Um, but at the end of the day, it comes down to our survivors are wanting that person who has harmed them to do their time, but also be held accountable to actually show that remorse. Want to come out not harming again. That's what they want. They want them to get the help that they need. And our prison systems don't really provide that. There, there are um, programs out there. Problem being, um, they're not working. We, we need yeah. something different within. So but the criminologist actually talked in that after that segment as well, and he actually said, I agree. 
programs that are currently and they're not working. But to show remorse, to do their time, to be held accountable, to not harm again, to get the help they need and to stop harming. Other than perhaps you could argue do their time, nothing else from that list will necessarily be provided by three strikes. So again, <coughs> pardon me, the thing that my disagreement with Louise Nicholas in this instance is that what she's looking for from three three strikes, three strikes will not provide Chewie. She, she's making good points about what she needs. I, I 100% agree. Like there's some absolutely fuck sentences out there when it comes to sexual assault and, and that sort of thing. Um, there are definitely cases where you see the judgment and you go, what the fuck was the judge think? You know? Um, when it comes to this, though, we, when you look at what leads people down, right, it, it, there's so much space for intervention before we get to the before we get to the there's always signs like people don't go out and decide to be a rapist just out of out of thin air yeah um and if, if we're looking at it's such a hard argument because there's, there's there's people going well what, what would you do about fucking rapists well that the whole thing would be to try and not have them rape for a start so, yeah. so what do we talk about? Do we talk about people's home lives where, where a lot of this is set up? Do we talk about their addiction issues? None of that is a punchy election slogan. None of, none of that is going to get votes, ever. It might be effective, but we'll, we'll never see it. We, yeah. it. We'll never see it on that bumper sticker, right? Everything yeah. we know is that prevention and rehabilitation gets better results than rolling out a fucking what a victorian model or just chuck everybody in a in a black hole yeah i mean th then you got to start to ask why is this happening and we already know that you know david seymour in particular i think wants to build prisons to hold is it five thousand more prisoners and then if we can't afford that what'll happen it'll get privatized back mm. you know it's those things but also truly you said the question what about rape right what do we do about rap? And and I agree. I would like to see those people treated as harshly as possible at that point in time. However, if we're going to have that hypothetical conversation, what about rape? We also have to have the other end of the spectrum conversation. What do we do about the guy who kissed someone and got seven years? What do we do about the guy who put his hand? Obviously, do I need to say, do I need to have a caveat? We don't support that kind of, of course, I don't need to. You already know that. But we also have to have the conversation on the other end is what about something that on the level of offences is quite minor that gets severe. So as long as we're having both of those conversations, I think it's a fair conversation. What happened in that chat was, and you know, Louise Nicholas, we, we, we've never heard someone get 20 years for rape. Great. But yes, I'm, 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 I'm with you. Like, let's have that conversation. But we also have to have what about the guy that got seven years? It has to be a part of this conversation as well. That's a, that's a, a full and honest conversation about this issue to then hopefully find an answer. They want to pour money into this, just absolutely unrestricted money, pour it into, into longer prison sentences and that sort of thing. But what they don't want to do is pour money into the these programs that, that look at the people that are doing mm. family harm, mm. uh, sexual offenders, all of that sort of thing, have to buggy, big, borrow, scrape. Can you imagine how how much of a soul crushing job to be a, like a good counselor you have to be an empathetic person right you have to put yourself in that person's shoes and try and guide them through changing their thinking you know making them realize they've done horrible horrible things and that they can change you have to go through that and you get paid a couple of bucks over minimum wage sometimes you know and these people have to go for funding grants and all of this sort of stuff big borrow prove that, that that they're worthy of 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 a paycheck yeah and so it, it's people that are, are are really driven to to do that are just burning themselves out in this role and then we get a government like this that comes in and, and doesn't acknowledge that at all because rehabilitation is soft we don't want to be soft the only thing that works is is tough toughness lock them away uh, which is why famously there weren't rapists in the in the good old days you know <laughs> yeah like we've just gotten soft ha now. having having a death sentence didn't stop these these things 
why do they think that three strikes is? Yeah, and I think that the point that the uh, criminal and and look for fairness, you know, um, Louise Nicholas pushed back on the point about you know people who don't think these things out logically. She said some do. I agree, some do. Some people have a complete sound mind when they commit horrific crimes. Others aren't. Again, you got to have the full conversation. You can't say all are or all aren't. Some are, some are not. And if you're not in your right mind, whether it's through rage, whether it's through alcohol, whether it's a mental health issue, whatever it is, um, that's a mitigating factor. Does it mean they get away with committing a crime? No, of course not. But it's, it should be a different result. What what My thought about, um, about prison and whatever is, actually, as Louise said, is probably 99% percent of people in prison will eventually get back out in society what we should be doing is what is best for them to get out and have a successful life continued on and not reoffend and not do something else that will cause them to go back in again now i think everyone would agree with that but we get one one part of the political spectrum who will give uh, like lip service to that they would agree with that and then they'll bring in three strikes which has got nothing to do with that. Mm. So what I would do, if you were sitting on on the ninth floor and Chewy was the Prime Minister, nationalise everything, is I'd be going, let's get all the research, let's get all the evidence, let's get all the people together, let's get all those community groups who are doing this, and let's find how this works best of all. And let's just, let's put that in place. Not just, we'll go back to what didn't work last time again by a national-led government, and we'll make it not work again, but we'll have more people in prison. Because, because... Labour, they just open the gate and let everybody out, and we're going to put everybody in. Vote national. There's, we, we've talked about this for so many other issues as well, right? Is that the the prevention is, is the key to get people when they're young and broken, rather than waiting till they're older and even more broken, mm. and then putting mm. them in a factory that essentially breaks them even more is just a one-way trip to a hiding like it just doesn't work like three strikes i think i think the thing that really annoys me about three strikes is it's just a blunt instrument yeah like it it disregards fact evidence background history you know it, it it just doesn't make any sense and it's it's so infuriating when it's something that is so clearly not effective that we're going to parrot it because it looks good on a bumper sticker. Yeah, and that's like the criminology. Right, I'm, I'm like, fucking Billy Big Nuts, tough on crime. Vote for me. It's like the you criminologist know, it's said. Just bullshit. It's just populist bullshit. Yeah, well, it's not that. It may not be that popular, but I hear what you're saying. And like the criminologist said, it's um, it's just turning the judge into a into a rubber stamp. There is one very interesting question though, and you might want to answer this one from the chat. Um, what about that? Is there one potential upside? You know, what if Damien Grant we, we, got a third We know it's a, not a deployed offense? against, yeah, but it's not deployed against those offenders, is it? Tax evaders and, and, and confidence fraudsters. It, it, it's not deployed against that. It's 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 deployed against violent criminals. So So once again, if we think about people that are getting a pass, you know, you can be a guy that comes up with an investment scam that, that takes hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars off hundreds of people who wipes out their retirement funds and that sort of thing. And they they get a slap on the wrist. You know, they might be back on a podcast or writing a, a thing in the New Zealand Herald. It's, or, it's or, fucking ridiculous. Or you can be a teenager with a baseball bat and get 200 bucks and get seven years. A um, couple of other chats here as well. Litchify says, uh, three strikes is a legal blunt instrument. Mm. It doesn't discern, mitigate the offence, weigh up the considerations, none of that. The fact that it's absolute makes it incredibly flawed. Um, yep. And 69 Scariot says, the problem with three strikes isn't in what it does to the people who deserve it. It's the damage it does to the people who don't deserve it. Yeah, very well said. Very well said. I mean, and, and, yeah, you go. A, a judge should have the ability to, to, to look at an offence on its own merits and look at its background as well, right? So if you had a guy that kept on coming up for the same crimes, right, you'd think that they would get sentenced harder anyway because the judge would sit there and go, you're not fucking learning the lesson, mate. Yeah. 
you know, it, 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 it just removes all of those tools. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Speaking of tools, you can pick Damien Grant or David Seymour. Where are we going next? Oh, is this fuck, Mary kill? I don't know what's going on. <laughs> pick one. That's going to be our next story. <laughs> let's, let's do convicted fraudster Damien Grant. Okay. Uh, there it is. And I want to say, I guess, congratulations or well done to Bomber. Lovely, lovely new studio. He's uh, he's doing his podcast now out of the um, MediaWorks Rover studio. Looks the part. Pretty cool. Um, I was talking to him the other day, and he got very excited because there was an auto cue. So he doesn't have to do this. <laughs> now, every time he's doing his introduction, he doesn't have to read his notes. And um, <laughs> did I just tell too much behind the, behind the window? What's going on behind the curtain? Anyway, um, okay, so this was a really interesting part of the, of the podcast that I found particularly interesting. They were discussing, you know, how Auckland University is basically as bad as the KKK. We all know that. We all know that. Um, and they get to a part of the conversation where um, Damien Grant's talking about separatism. And he's talking about how you guys, because it's, it's Shane Tapo and it's John Tamahiri in there with him and Damien Grant's talking about oh, you guys you guys are into separatism you're into separatism you're all for separatism um and then he spins it a bit now he basically says he doesn't use these words but as a um, as a libertarian he's totally cool with any kind of separatism whether it's rich white men having their own thing or da 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 um so we, we pick this up when he's just basically started talking about um John and Shane being kind of really into into separatism into separate spaces that sort of stuff and that's where we're going to pick it up from I am, I am heartened to hear the two of you, you know, embracing these issues because I believe. Here we go. Believe, here we go. This I is, believe. No, I don't embrace it. No, them. we don't embrace it. I, I, reject I them. believe. <laughs> no, but, but you, yeah, you got queer spaces and you got mm. Maori spaces and you yeah. spaces. And yeah. so, so what you plenty, plenty of parking spaces out so, there, mate. And, and so yeah. what you're saying. Did you see the CEO, CEO list today, mate? What exclusively, right? exclusively parking. So and don't tell us that parking spaces don't and, exist. And, right? and, and so, so yeah. what, what we're saying is that we want to we want to have an environment yeah. where people can selectively only be with their own kind and race. And I believe, no, no. and I believe absolutely. That name, we five should, Ma name five name five mates should, that come to your house on a regular should, basis, mate. Name should, five. We no, no, you accuse us of being separatists, mate. But I want to say to you, Damien, no, you're you're Shane, the separatist. You're missing we the live points. no 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 I understand your point and we get this shit all the time. Mm -hmm. We live in both worlds every day. Don't accuse us of separatism, no, Damien. You're saying you are not So what Damien Grant's obviously doing, he's trying to be a bit bit funny, have a bit of play on words, and he's trying to be light hearted. But but the point that it's about to get made is actually as a Maori living in a European centric situation, they they're the ones who are involved they're the ones who are facing separatism all the time. And it's not pro Maori, it's pro the other way. It's just a really interesting spin on this whole conversation. Got anything, Chili? Should we keep going? I, I I just love the fact that Damien Grant is unaware of the history of segregation in New Zealand. There were whites only areas yeah. in New Zealand. Yeah. You know, there, and there's lots of ways of doing it as well. You know, oh, you want to apply to the the country club? Mm. Yeah, sorry, sorry, Rungi, your your application is denied. Oh yeah, but we need someone to work in the kitchen. More than welcome to do that. All right, we'll keep going with these two. So you can see, it's almost like uh, Damien Grant's trying on some level to be sort of lighthearted, but. But Shane yeah, and John are like, like we're, we're not playing this game because this is actually real to us. You're you're actually minimizing our lives by joking around this. This is a real thing we see. And um, yeah, I just think uh, Damien Grant doesn't come off that well. Not listening to me. I support separatism. Because you're talking shit. I believe you should be able to <laughs> discriminate on the yeah. grounds of race. I believe you should be able to discriminate well, we on don't, the grounds we, of Well, we of don't religion. because we live and operate in a bicultural, so, multicultural world every so day, when Damien. I, you when don't. I saw, when when um, uh, you know, Shane, you know nothing about my life. So, um, uh, with well, respect, answer that question. With, with, answer with, that question, Damien. With, with, with respect, I don't yeah. think you should be commenting on the my nature of my life. Yeah, but, well... But okay, tell I, us about but it. Then. I fundamentally believe. Tell us you how you operate in a biocultural world on a daily basis. I mean, you don't. That, Who does this show? <laughs> I'm sitting in the room with you. But we do. I have no problem. I have no problem with organisations saying, "Hey, this is for 
people of our group and our tribe, whether it's your race, whether it's your religion, whether it's your sexuality, I don't care. And if you want to have a space that is exclusively for Maori, I am fine with that. If you want to have a space that is exclusively for Indians, I am fine with that. Mm. And if you want to have, if you want to set up a club and it's only for white rich men, I am fine with that too. But well, Northern I believe, Club is. <laughs> I, um, I, I believe. It's called the Northern Club. It's called the, the, the Business Rich List, isn't it? Isn't that their club we're talking about, Chewy? Maybe the Rich List is? Maybe? Possibly. There's something else that's coming up as well that I wanted to pre warn you about. Not, not in a bad way. But there's a really interesting moment in this where. Damien gets called um, a separatist, not a or, supremacist. Sorry, I was just trying to get me. Mm. He gets called a supremacist, not white supremacist, just a supremacist, and he doesn't like it. And what you see come out is what you see come out a lot. Was he is basically saying, "Do not call me that." There's a quick to and fro about how that um, that Shane and John are critical of the Israeli government. And guess what word he throws at them, Chewie? Just guess. <laughs> should we, should we, so he doesn't like words being thrown at him based on what he thinks is a flimsy conclusion. And then within seconds, he throws a word far, far, far more serious, in my opinion, at them for an incorrect conclusion. We'll keep going. I believe that this obsession we have... We don't. With, um, with this obsession we have with... Oh my goodness! You know we've. Um, you uh, might have an obsession, JT, and I don't have an obsession because no. we operate in a in a biculture world on a daily basis, Damien. Well, how are we mm. obsessed by it? That's the way we operate. We understand Hold our. On. We John, understand. John, we understand John, our. John's we understand president. our. We understand our Scottish. We understand You're our Scottish of the party. Of the party. party. That's a rights-based party. Yeah, not a race-based yeah, party. That's right. And you got to get that into your head, yeah. you fool. John, yeah. it is. It is called to party Maori. Mm. It is. What would you want us to be called? Yeah. <laughs> like, not, honky, yeah. not honky. The not honky party. What would you want us to be I called? Have no, I have no problem yeah. with a race based party. I, it, does, it does not worry me. No, no, at all. no, no, we, no, no, hang on. Hang on. Just in case you listen to the um, audio podcast and it's a bit jumbly and jargony, um, Damien Grant is currently talking about the Māori Party being a race based party, and the president of the Māori Party is sitting there, along with Shane DePoe, saying, it's not a race-based party; it's a rights-based party, mm. which which I think is probably borne out by the members that belong to the Māori Party who are not Māori. You know, because they've used the Māori Party as the label, people like uh, Damien Grant um, can throw that out there. But I think it's pretty clear that because anyone can be a member of the Māori Party, whatever race you are, surely it, it wouldn't be classed as a race-based first. It would be a Rights based as they're claiming, Chewy. Hmm. Oh, we get to, Damien Grant. All right, we'll just get to the end of this. There's only about uh, yeah, 60, there's only about 35, 30, 35 seconds to go. 35 seconds to go. So, this is the part I want to look at the interaction between don't call me that, by the way, you're this. I'm talking about that. Like, mm. like somebody said it's a race based party because some racist mm. arrived here yeah. and determined that there should yeah. be racism, right? Mm. Uh, I didn't. Yeah. Ma- Māori didn't. <laughs> so Te Pāti Māori is a, a party for the indigenous people, mm. and they've got constitutional rights upon which they consented to people like mm. Damien to come here. Mm. Nice people that we are. Mm. Good people. Yeah, but, but they turned on us. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the problem that we've got right now is, is that we're not allowed to be Māori. We've got to be nice, white, brown people. And that's what they want us to be. But the problem is that it ain't ever going to be, right? Mm. So I just want to be a proud Māori. Yeah. And and I want to say I'm a proud Māori rather than feel in saying that I, I have just yeah. uh, jilted him, offended yeah. him. How? And, and, and how? Happens. I don't know because I don't care. When you're privileged <laughs> and you're a supremacist and <laughs> everything's been going your way, I, hold on, you, hold so, on. some people do get a bit upset. You can you can you can say I'm privileged, but you shouldn't say I'm a, I'm a, a supremacist. No, 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 no. Um, no, well, no, yeah, you've got you to can. be your, your, your <laughs> taxpayers. Yeah, but, comrades, but also. comrades, we must move on <laughs> no, to Shane, issue you're, three. You're about to say oh, no, no, I'm just, I'm just about to say uh, that uh, on most Māori issues, you are on the other side of the divide from us. Uh, you Name support, one. You, su- you, you, support, you, su- one. you support the ongoing genocide of our Palestinian brothers and sisters through your support of Israel. That yeah. makes you a supremacist. No, that makes you an anti-Semite. Mm. Comrades, no, we... There you go. Oh, I knew it was coming. But yeah, well, I told Christ, you it was coming. It's a lazy so argument. It's a very lazy argument. So like, it, it was a really interesting conversation, though, and I quite liked that from looking at the presentation, it looked like 
Damien Grant was being like matey matey with him and making a joke and you know I could make a joke with my Maori friend sort of thing and they were just like uh no how about no, no? how about no no because because you can see his angle like four miles away like yeah. Damien Grant thinks he's a deep thinker I don't I don't see it myself like he he is a supremacist you can sit there like if you're defending the status quo of race relations in New Zealand you are a supremacist Damien Grant moves in a completely European system. He he doesn't have to try and adapt to another culture or anything like that. He, he can just move around. It's his own culture, and he's perfectly happy with that. Yeah. And I can understand that sense of, of, of comfort because, I guess what, that's the world that I move around in as well. And this is where people get really bent out of shape when we start talking about using more Tereo or trying to get the pronunciation right, the place names right, or that sort of thing, or being a bit more cognizant of other cultures. And they might have needs that are different from ours. They might have backgrounds that are different from ours. As you have to go out of your way. Some people are quite happy to do that. Some people take it as a mortal insult. And I think when someone turns around and goes, you're a supremacist, I think that's twigged as, oh, fuck, that's a little bit close to home. Yeah. you know. And I think they're quite right to draw a parallel between his support of Israel and this, because, again, that is supporting a, a, a supremacist society that's trying to inflict their will on another people. He can see the mirror there. Whether he wants to acknowledge it or not, there's a fucking mirror pointing right at him on that one. I, I think as well, for me, and Chewie, I've, I've been talking to a few people around Dunedin, friends and, and some family as well, um, about what we do here and when we start talking about this I always talk about how this podcast by some me probably you but I, I know personally through me have been labeled anti-semitic by several people if not groups whatever and what you just saw was that kind of that kind of a uh, tactic where Zionists will use possibly one of the most serious offensive sort of accusations like what's what's i mean saying racist to me doesn't feel as heavy as anti-semite i don't know why but mm. you can have maybe many flavors of racism but there's only one flavor of anti-semite yeah. and they That'd use it a waste of history yeah right. behind that and, and they use it as a, a cover all get out of jail free card and what you just heard there was um shane i think it was saying that you support the genocide in gaza nothing about judaism in that statement mm. no, nothing about you know faith there's no faith-based positions in there it's talking about now you can even I'm, I'm when i say you can argue i don't mean i would argue but one could form an argument to push back on the uh, on the um uh genocide word if they wanted to but no all of that gets skipped over and they go straight to because you're an anti-semite yeah. Because because you've said that I support that I support the country that, in your opinion, is committing genocide, you're an anti-Semite, and it's just it's it's almost to the Jewish community it's almost disrespectful because how much power does that take away from actual mm -hmm. anti-Semitism? Yeah. Saying oh you yeah. you you disagree with that? No, who anti-Semite? You know how much yeah. power does that take away from honest, real, a real truthful anti-Semitism? Yeah, absolutely. Damien threw that out like he's at Hogwarts practicing like, a spell. Like he had it loaded, though. Loaded, ready to go. Yeah, yeah. He was, he was ready to go. Anti-Semite. <laughs> Duck and cover. Like, it, it's it's fucking bullshit. Because not every Jew has gone out and, and, and invaded Gaza. You know, Israel has. The country of Israel. The state of Israel has. Um, there are enough <laughs> like there's so many Jews worldwide that are like not in my name. This no, you know, that are standing against this. He's he's completely ignoring them. But as you said, people throwing that around, throwing away the anti-Semite thing, just removes power. You know, there, there are times where we're calling someone an anti-Semite is is it's it's in the toolbox. But every time it's thrown around, it's just like it's empty. Yeah. Like, Daniel threw that around like it was empty. It's actually almost, you know how people put up on Twitter and stuff when they get blocked by a person, a, a, a 
particular disgusting person, they put that screen grab and they go, ah, that's a win for me. This person's blocked me. I know some people on the right have done that to me because other people have shown me. But when someone calls you an anti-Semite for criticizing the policies and uh, the IDF, the policies of Israel and the IDF, it's almost a badge of honor now, I think, almost, because the only people doing it are the most revolting people who them themselves are either Jewish or Zionists, Israelis or Zionists. And um, and when they do it to you, it's like, oh, okay, so you're, you're not prepared to engage at all because you're doing that thing that is absolutely, you're running away. Someone just put in, I think it was uh, gold actually, just put in the chat, I didn't start it though. Is there a Godwin's law for anti-Semitism? There we go. For those who don't know, God, Godwin's <laughs> yeah, yeah, law yeah. is the longer an internet conversation goes on, the uh, the the chance <laughs> or the rate of Hitler being or Nazism being evoked grows. Is there a Godwin's law for falling back on anti-Semite when the argument is lost? Yeah, possibly there is gold as well. So yeah. Anyway, I mean, it was a, it was a good show. You guys should all go check it out. It's uh, just look up either Martin Bradbury or the Working Group podcast on YouTube. You'll find it and um every tuesday night i guess at is it 7 30 i think it might be 7 30 i always watch it on demand the next day very good all right now to the dumbest story of the day well from the dumbest person of the day in fact shall i i'll show you this first uh i know i've got i actually tweeted about this this afternoon and i was quite surprised this this twitter echo chamber has become very right wing alt right you know you guys are all pedos and living in your mother's basement stuff but i did one out today and um the response in the in the in the comments was all like what the fuck uh david mm -hmm. seymour what are you on i was i mean i didn't i don't need i don't need it to be like that because i don't care but it was quite surprising that there was so much pushback from all sorts of people so let's have a look at this um moron and this idea of uh we need to send sick children to school now you know there's only one reason for this and that's so they can have better attendance numbers than labor that's the only reason. There is no other reason for this other than to be able to go, hey, Labour, you guys, 46%, we, 70%. The next thing they'll do, Chewy, this is the next thing, is they'll change the bands and they'll make it from 80 to 100, you know, and the, rather than 90 to 100%, they'll change the bands and then they'll be able to claim, actually, that's we should bookmark this. That's a really good point. I wouldn't be surprised if that happened. <laughs> All right, let's have a look at this moron talking to New Zealand, the future Deputy Prime Minister of our country. Good Lord. Back home, public health advice around student illness is about to change. Uh, public health advice is about that. Official public health advice about sending your sick children to school. That's what the official public health advice is going to be under this government. It's part of the government's crackdown on truancy. Associate Education Minister David Seymour says the number of students missing school because of sickness has doubled since the pandemic began. He says sometimes if... I mean, do we want to start already? Really? So, like since so the pandemic on. hit, since since millions of people around the world and hundreds of thousands in New Zealand got sick with a brand new desert, virus, really? They've doubled. Kuh, go figure, Chewy. Are we also drawing a straight line between sickness absences and truancy? Because those two things are not the fucking yeah, same. They don't. I, I, as far as I know, they don't. They don't. Well, let's keep going and see what they do say. This is a, this is like Christmas. We'll unwrap it all together. You've got to make a call between health and education, and a sniffle or a cold might not be sufficient for a day off anymore. Leighton Hakel reports. If you're sick, stay home. That's always been the message, especially for school students. It's common sense. If a child is sick, they need to stay home. But the Associate Education Minister says it's gotten out of hand. Whoever accused this government of having common sense, though, Joey? I mean, who would ever do that? associate education minister coming out giving advice on the health of your children talk about fucking nanny state mm. telling telling parents that they should be getting their kids back to school in the last few years uh, you've seen the proportion of kids held back um, citing illness uh, roughly double um, and it tends to often be a sniffle or a cold. So in his crusade against truancy he says the public health advice for schools is going to change. Yes of course health is important, of course you've got to be responsible but you don't keep but, people home uh, under but, all circumstances. Sometimes you've got to make a call between health and education. It's pretty unrealistic considering the amount of viruses and bugs that go around schools. The advice on the Ministry of Education's website tells schools to encourage all staff and students who are feeling ill to not attend school. Now, 
Chewy, how many times have we talked about the worker and the employer? So if they're mm -hmm. currently telling teachers to stay home if they're sick and this government wants to change it, doesn't that feel like a conversation we've had recently where some bosses like to force their workers back to work even if they're sick? The pressure they lay on them to come back even if they're sick to fill their to fill their little office or their desk or their or their cubicle. And this government the one that's trying to break workers' rights left, right, and centre are now going to change the rules or change the advice, which are currently saying, teacher, if you're sick, stay home. So if they're going to change that, what's the only other thing it can be? Teacher, if you're not too sick, you should probably come in. Worker, I want you to come in and pack those bags. Worker, I want you to get back on the till. Worker, you need to be in front of this classroom because we don't want to pay too many substitute teachers, Chewy, because we need to save $3 billion. I, I just love the fact that we... We are barely out of a global pandemic, and based on this, we have learned nothing. So, your kid, your kid has to be at school. The school's been told to crack down on this sort of stuff. The kid's got to come to school. Kid comes to school with sniffles. Kids in the in the overcrowded, underventilated school building. Yeah, they get sick. They go home. They give the sickness to their families. Then their families are off sick. And then people are out of the workplace. Or maybe, because they can't afford to, they go to work as well. They make their colleagues sick as well. And look, this is how viruses work. We fucking... Did we learn nothing? <laughs> did we Appar learn absolutely nothing? Apparently this... not. God damn. As soon as I saw that, that Seymour had, had anything to do with the education, I was like, oh, fuck, this isn't good. But I... It's this combination with um, with we're gonna we're gonna put our fingers in areas and we're gonna ignore long COVID as well now. Yep. Like, it, we spent so much time on this <laughs> early on in the show, talking about air standards in schools and why the schools weren't doing what they should around COVID and that sort of thing. We we're just gonna forget the collective lessons. This in two years. No, afterwards no it good point though. fucking ridiculous no good point though why don't the school say okay uh new health regulations that's fine but if you want us to do this we can do this but you need to properly ventilate every single room uh so that w when the sick child comes to school uh there is a lessened chance of them affecting the people around them perhaps the teacher other people as well so so give us good ventilation and we'll do it do, do you what? know, like, I, I love her mentioning the sniffles as, as like this, oh, it's just the sniffles. Do you know what one of the early symptoms of measles is? <laughs> the sniffles. All right, we'll keep going. This has got a whole 45 seconds to go. We'll see, maybe we're wrong. Maybe he's going to save it. Maybe Seymour's going to turn it around and pull it out at the end. Let's have a look, shall we? We'll look together with hope in our heart. I find it really interesting that David Seymour is looking to be the person that determines uh, what criteria should be used for, for kids to not be at school because of sickness. And actually, I'm a little bit worried because it could be quite dangerous um, given all of the factors that need to be taken into consideration. Parents say they should decide. I think um, me as her parent should. Well, of course. I mean, like, I'm, I'm interested whether they're implying here that parents won't be able to decide anymore. Because parents say they should decide implies that these new regulations in the school are going to force parents' hands to get their kids. I don't know how. I don't. I don't see how that's actually possible. Because all a parent having children going through high school, all a parent has to do is just phone up and say, "Child is sick. I'm the father. This is my phone number. Won't be there today." And hang up. But if if this is going to be like, a, let's try and force the hands of the parents. Talk about nanny state. Oh my goodness. Have the final say on that. They know their kids. So if they keep them home, majority of parents keep them home for a reason. We've had several years of stay home, save lives, and almost everything comes after health. I think we need to start rebalancing that. That rebalance, whatever it may look like, what? will form part of the government's attendance action plan launched by the end of June. So um, we've had the focus on we've we've had the focus on being healthy. We've had that focus, the one on health first. Yeah, we don't want to have that focus on health first anymore. We want to have a different focus. Uh, we want to get these little 
people to understand going to school sick is what you need to do. So that means when they are workers in their 20s, they'll already be trained to go into work sick. So we don't have a problem with, uh, you know, employing people all the time. Actually, maybe in fairness, because pseudo ephedrine's back, you just put a, fill, them up, fill the kids up with pseudo ephedrine, put them back in. Uh, we, we're going to ignore the cognitive effects of long COVID uh, on a developing mind. Um, we don't need high IQs to keep the machines running. Uh, just someone has to come in every now and then to push space bar on the fucking <laughs> AI. You know, so it's the- it's just so short-sighted. Um, so let's have a look. Right, this is Twitter today. A beacon of hope. I put this out, I don't know. Oh, 5.30. The quote that he made, of course, health important, of course, you've got to be responsible, but you don't keep people home under all circumstances. Sometimes you've got to make a call between health and education. Um, And these are some of the replies. I'll just give you a random first 10 or so. Um, uh, It definitely was when there was almost zero risk for school students. As a teacher Mm -hmm. who taught throughout the pandemic, I think Seymour's policy will just create higher staff abstinences Mm -hmm. through increased exposure to infection. This will make things far worse than an 85% daily attendance. Uh, Sending children to school so they can be part of another super spreader. Great. Back to square one again. Uh, Thought Act didn't actually care if your child is at school or not, let alone their health. What uh, what they do care about, though, is the parent that is home with them not contrib- to contributing to the productivity of whomever they work for. It's ne- necro capitalism. It's supposed to be neo, maybe, capitalism. Uh, does Seymour not understand that teachers get sick as a result of students? Look, just all the way through. More and more, more. Remember, with this government, people dying of cancer will have to look for work. Has he ever consulted the teachers? Uh, talking about Dave Littell there. So um, just fascinating. And fascinating to watch. If we, Chewy, if we acknowledge that this man is, throw up in the back of my mouth a little bit, but smart, or has an IQ that would put him in that smart bracket, then why is he doing it? Like, if he's a moron, it all makes sense. Like, it makes sense if he's an absolute fucking moron. But if he's not, what does Occam's razor say? What is the most likely scenario as to why he's doing that? I think that they've got the attendance numbers. They want them to look better no matter what. Anything mm-hmm. else, though? What else? Interesting comment about the parents staying at home. That was a really interesting point made on my Twitter feed. Yeah, yeah. No, a- absolutely. Um, yeah, it's just fucked. Like his other comments around around fining parents for absences and stuff like that. Uh, but we're not going to find people that can't afford it. Yeah, of course. As, as, as just like, the, remember that the ACT Party is nominally on paper a libertarian party. And then you have its leader telling people that the kids have to go to school no matter what Mm. you know that it's it's just i want to say it baffles me it does baffle me this is like people voted for well i don't know if people voted for this but this is what they've got for voting for them no they didn't vote for this just insane as one particular left-wing commentator always says they voted to have their house prices increased by 10 percent. they didn't vote for this culture war Mm. bullshit um because ikea says nanny state next comes women's reproductive rights two dollar super chat thank you for your uh, super chat there uh from an earlier conversation mr arvid's two dollar super chat thank you for that damian grant group of the exclusive fraudsters Hmm. and uh lutzfei says what damian grant is missing in his argument is that real separatism, e.g. apartheid, is mainly about the exploitation of an ethnic group than simple difference, different people enjoying others who identify. Hmm. Anything else in the chat we want to get to? Uh, No, I think that's that's covered the ones that I had started. Yep. Cool bananas, people. So it's a short week this week, obviously. Uh, tomorrow night's the last show. And I think what we'll do, and we, we said we might do it last week, but I think I'd like to commit to, unless it's a little bit like, you know how you have your day of work plan, but if, if something extraordinary happens, you throw it out the window. So unless something extraordinary happens in the news or, or something, or, you know, Jesus Christ himself wants to come on the podcast, we'd probably bump you guys for him, just so you know. Maybe. Mind you, if he's not a patron, we probably wouldn't actually join so you can, I, you can just wait. I have just seen something really worth mentioning in the chat here. Okay, go. So 
there has been someone suggesting that maybe parents should just get a medical certificate to prove that they're not lying to the schools. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, sounds good on paper, right? Can I, just before we keep going, can I add something? Who the fuck mm-hmm. cares if the parents are lying to the school? Parents' business. Mm-hmm. Or every parent at some stage has told the school a white lie about a child being away because there was something else on. You know, and they and they have told them what. So, who, so what? It, what? How nanny state do you want to give? You want to have a I, lie detector, I, I, lie detector at the front of the school to make sure its parents aren't lying to you? <laughs> Fuck off! I, I'm trying to use this as as a as a as a a, a learning point here. Okay. Of um, I'll step away. I'll step sounds, away from the mic. Sounds good on paper, right? And you see this with with pol- policies and all sorts of stuff. It sounds great on paper. Mm-hmm. You know, it's just like if you're at work, right, and you're off off sick for more than three days you can be asked to produce a doctor's certificate okay who here in the chat has tried to get a doctor's appointment and been able to get one in less than three days that's so true my bloody doctor it's like yeah he's free next thursday like, no. but- cool. so so you can't get it right now and 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 you're worried because seymour's going to send the educational gestapo around to issue the fines so now we've got to take the kids to urgent care to get a certificate to get get fucking social services off your back it's fucking ridiculous can i ask a question i've just had a little i like saving the country money like i'm all about Mm. that do you think um that the the police force that uh mr seymour has to put together to catch parents lying to their school could also be the penis police that winston's going to put together could we have them in the same team and that's like one team to do both jobs one one team to rule them all I'm just that so would work, wouldn't two, it? They, 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 the winky the warriors and, and the, the sickness. Thinking, the, the genital SS. Gestapo is going to be too yeah. busy because yeah. everybody knows that there's trans people hiding in the wood pile. Okay. Um, but yeah, that's the thing. The other aspect of that, of, of you know, if your employer has to ask you for a medical certificate, if they ask you, they have to pay for it. Yeah. So is now the Ministry of Education paying for parents to take their kids? to get a, a, an urgent doctor medical certificate because they won't make it to um, fourth period PE. Like, it's 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 retarded. Pull, take your brain out of the pot that you had it sitting in. Put it back in your head. Yeah. Yeah. Citizen Gold is saying, sorry, penis police, what the fuck did I miss? Winston Peters about checking people in bathrooms, him pitching to the anti-trans brigade to get votes. He said he was going to yeah. make sure all spaces. Yada, yeah, yada. We, we didn't really land on a name. You know, mm. Peter's. I like the Winky Warriors. Pe- the Winky Warriors is pretty good. Yeah, you got Peter's Penis Police, which has obviously got that whole alliteration thing going on. Penis, uh, penis. Winnie's police. Winky Warriors. Yeah, so falls on that. I'm yeah. a fan of genital Gestapo. Yeah, that's quite good, actually. Because you could have the the GG and the SS, the Sicko Squad. And they, they just they just put like they can have like reverse jackets like those cool you know like I'm a 1950s high school football player and they could be reversible and they could just flip them around depending which you know which which uh, minority they're going after. There you go, that works. So anyway, I don't know how we got there, but I was talking about tomorrow. No, night we should open. Neither. We should open. <laughs> we should open up the uh, Discord and see if you want to have a chat. Now, once again, to all you lovely people, I haven't had time. Look, I've still got them right here. Look at all my tracking numbers, Chewy. These are all tracking numbers. <laughs> I haven't had time to send them out today. I, I expect some of your gear might be turning up tomorrow. It's in the post. It got put in the post first thing Tuesday. Well, well the, the courier first thing Tuesday morning. And um, I might still get to it, but I'm trying to squeeze five days' work into three, day, three days so I can have a weekend off with my partner to celebrate our sixth anniversary. Oh, have you sent me a present yet? Hmm? No, you haven't. Okay, that's fine. I don't your present is to be works. with us. Your present is to be with us. Your present is your presence. See what I did there? That was a play on words. It's, a, it's very strange. Yeah. Are you but, getting your dog? Like, but, no, I, I just... Oh, God. Knock Jeez, me. Stuff. There we go. Look at that. Okay. Come. Up, up. Come up. Oh, you don't like it when I pick you up, do you? But we'll do it for the people. We'll do it for the uh, thumbnail. <laughs> He doesn't like this. Oh. Oh. You can put your feet up there. That's all right, mate. Where are we? This is a bit weird. You've never, literally, never, ever done this before in your life, have you? Yeah, no. Look at she's freaking the fit here. Sorry, mate. I know. I was, I was trying to, I was trying to get clout off you. I was trying to get some clout. It's not fair, is it? Go, go back to your mat then. Where well, you're happy. All right. All right. Back again. 
Okay, well, we started wrapping up uh, officially nine minutes ago, and it's taken us this long to get to goodbye. So long, farewell, our Vita Zing. Do you like sound of music? What? Sound Isn't of music. Isn't that, that musical about the Nazis? Oh, Godwin's Law. We got there in the end. Hey. <laughs> they came up. All right, team. We'll catch you tomorrow night from uh, 9 p.m. for another edition of Big Hero News. Thanks for being with us tonight. Enjoyed the show. Enjoyed you all. Thanks for the chat. And we'll be uh, we'll be back here this time in about twenty three hours or so for our last show of mm. the week. Um, it's so weird when your muscle memory goes off. In my muscle memory, right then, I haven't worked for ZB since twenty eleven. I was about to say good night. <laughs> I was about to say oh eight hundred eighty ten eight. Like I swear that was coming out of my mouth. Muscle memory is the craziest thing. All right, team. Catch you tomorrow night from nine. Be safe, everyone. Remember, come back tomorrow night. Bring a friend. Hooroo. No nice.